On the morning of June 29, 2013, the vice president of loss prevention at the popular Toys R Us retail store in New York received a call from the police. They told him that there had been an incident at the Hamburg store, and they urgently needed his assistance. Bernie Grusa rushed to the store, and when he got there, the police shared with him the heartbreaking news. The store manager, Larry Wells, had been fatally stabbed in his office during the early morning shift. He was on duty at 4 a.m. that morning, helping the night staff unpack stock, as well as prepare for the opening of the store that morning. There were only four other employees with him on duty that morning, yet none of them could tell the police who had murdered Larry. With no signs of forced entry or indication that anyone else had been there, police began to suspect that it may have been an inside job. They thought that the killer was most probably one of the four employees who had worked with Larry that morning, but their police intuition wasn't able to narrow down on a suspect. All four employees caught the attention of the police for various reasons, but there was no clear evidence pointing to the culprit. So, in their quest to solve the case, the police turned to Bernie Grusa, the vice president of loss prevention, hoping that the store's CCTV footage could shed some light on what happened that morning. As the police meticulously examined the CCTV footage frame by frame, they suddenly spotted something that would throw the case wide open. Larry Wells was born on September 22, 1977, in Dunkirk, New York. As a child, he was shy, quiet, and a bit reserved around others. It took him some time to open up, but once he did, his warm and helpful nature became evident to everyone around him, and he was definitely the kind of person you could always rely on. During his time in high school, he met his wife, Jill, and right from the start, they were inseparable. Even though they were only 15 years old when they started dating, they both knew that this relationship was so much more than just a high school fling. Their bond grew stronger over time, and they became each other's pillars of support. After completing high school, Larry and Jill attended the State University of New York at Fredonia, where Larry graduated with a degree in elementary education and went on to earn a master's from Walden University. Before landing a job as a substitute teacher at an elementary school, Larry felt that he was living out his passion. He loved being around kids, and his friendly, approachable demeanor allowed him to easily form strong bonds with his students. The fact that Larry was somewhat of a big kid himself made him instantly relatable to his students, and he had a knack for bringing out the best in them. By the time 2006 rolled around, Larry had big aspirations for the future he was building with his wife. He had dreams of becoming financially stable, starting a family of his own, and even owning his own house. And even though he loved his work as a teacher, he became frustrated with not being able to find permanent work. Being in and out of a job at regular intervals meant that he couldn't sufficiently plan for the future. That's how he ended up taking a job at Toys R Us. The job was only supposed to be a temporary solution while he searched for permanent employment in the education sector. However, fate had other plans for Larry. Despite initially viewing the job at Toys R Us as a stopgap measure, he quickly demonstrated his dedication and leadership skills, which quickly propelled him through the ranks eventually becoming the store manager at the Hamburg branch. By 2013, Larry had been dedicatedly working at the store for nearly six years, and his life was finally shaping up just as he had always dreamed. His bond with his wife had grown stronger than ever, and the couple was overjoyed to have started their own family. In fact, Jill was pregnant with their second daughter, and they were eagerly looking forward to expanding their little family. Though retail work often demanded long and irregular hours, including weekends and holidays, Larry took it all in his stride, knowing that it came with the territory. So, when Larry was requested to work on Saturday, June 29, 2013, he saw it as just another working day, never imagining the horrors which would unfold. Larry arrived at the store at 3.55 a.m. so that he could assist the night shift employees, Cindy and Isaac, with unpacking stock and preparing the store for opening. They had been tirelessly stocking shelves throughout the night, and Larry thought that they would appreciate the help. At 4.53 a.m., Larry received a radio call from Anthony, another employee at the store who was scheduled to start his shift at 5 a.m. The store's doors were all locked, and only the manager had the authority to let him in. At this time, Larry and the three other employees, Cindy, Isaac, and Anthony, were the only ones in the store, each of them working in different sections of the store, relying on their radios to communicate with one another. Just after 5 a.m., another store employee named Richard arrived at work, 
just as Anthony had done a few moments earlier. Richard radios Larry to let him in, but strangely, Larry doesn't respond to the call. Richard tries to open the door, but, as expected, he found it to be locked. Still unable to get hold of Larry, Richard walks around the perimeter of the store, and to his surprise, he finds that the door of the adjacent Baby's R Us store is unlocked. Richard then enters through this door, punches in for his shift, and starts working. The employees all went about their job as usual, continuing their work in their respective aisles until 5.40 a.m., when Isaac became increasingly annoyed by a persistent beeping sound echoing through the store. Determined to put an end to the disturbance, he picks up his radio and calls his manager to ask that he switch off the alarm. Larry doesn't respond to the call, so after trying for a second time, Isaac assumes that Larry is probably on another call in his office. So, he radios Cindy, asking her to go check up on Larry and ask him to turn off the alarm. Cindy happily obliges and makes her way to Larry's office. In less than a minute, a howling scream echoes through the store. The other employees, all sensing the dread in Cindy's voice, rush to their manager's office, only to find Larry slouched in his chair, bleeding from what appeared to be a gunshot wound, according to Cindy's initial observation. She immediately dialed 911, and within a couple of minutes, help arrived. After checking Larry's pulse, they determined that although he was non-responsive, his heart was still beating. Acting quickly, paramedics placed him in an ambulance and raced him to the hospital, but tragically, Larry was pronounced dead upon arrival. The cause of his death was confirmed to be due to severe blood loss, and contrary to the initial belief of a gunshot, it was later determined that he had been stabbed three times in the chest. When police arrived at the scene, their first thought was that it had to be one of the four employees who was with Larry in the store, especially since there was no sign of forced entry. Cindy was the first person to draw the police's attention. She was the one who worked closest to Larry's office, and she was the one who had found him. Richard was also a prime suspect. He had arrived late for work that morning, and he was also the last person to enter the store. He also said that he entered through the Baby's R Us store, which was different from the usual store protocol. Police also noticed that Isaac seemed to be nervous and evasive, while Anthony blatantly refused to cooperate or answer any questions. So, with no clear leads and each suspect presenting their own potential reasons for suspicion, the police decided to turn their attention to the store's CCTV footage, hoping it could shed light on the events of that tragic morning. They immediately called Bernard Grusa, the vice president and regional manager for loss prevention, and within 20 minutes, Bernard was there. He immediately assisted the police with any questions they had and explained that he was the one who hired Larry for the manager role and considered him not just an employee, but a close friend as well. He then took the police to Larry's office where they went to review the surveillance footage and what they would find was nothing short of shocking. At 4.20 a.m., approximately 25 minutes after Larry Wells had arrived at work, the surveillance footage reveals a person attempting to break into the store by manipulating the lock. The intruder gains entry through the adjoining Babies R Us section. Despite the grainy and low-resolution quality of the footage, the police were able to establish that the individual was a man wearing a scarf, cap, and sweatpants, and he appeared to be carrying a knife. Police watched as the man sneaked through the aisles of the store, seemingly trying to evade the cameras, skillfully maneuvering through the aisles before entering the manager's office and closing the door behind him. Three minutes after the man entered the manager's office, the surveillance video stopped. It was clear that the man in the footage had unplugged the recording equipment to ensure that he wasn't captured on camera. Police believe that Larry Wells entered the office a short while later, and that was when the man attacked him. After viewing the surveillance footage, the police were now certain of two things. First, the fact that the intruder was able to move through the store without being detected, and then strategically unplug the surveillance equipment strongly suggested that it was likely an inside job. Second, after observing the suspect on camera, the police were able to determine that none of the other employees who were present in the store that morning could have been the killer. So, the police set about trying to uncover more evidence. During the initial search of the office, police found a black and gold baseball cap, which seemed to match the cap that the killer was wearing in the video. They suspected that he may have dropped it on his way out. Police immediately sent it for DNA testing, hoping that they would find a match. Unfortunately, the DNA didn't come back as a match to anyone in the database, so police had to rely on good old detective work. Approaching every single Toys R Us store employee and asking them to willingly provide a DNA sample. 
if their theory about an inside job was accurate, they believed this method would be the best way to narrow down the list of suspects and identify the person responsible for the heinous crime. It was June 29th when Lawrence Wells was found stabbed to death inside a Hamburg Toys R Us. Despite surveillance pictures, a hefty reward, and desperate pleas from family members, his killer remains on the run. Over the course of the next two months, the police embarked on a process of collecting DNA samples from the dozens of store employees and eliminating them one by one without any success in finding a match to the suspect's DNA. But as they approached the stage where nearly every single employee had been tested, they noticed that one notable name hadn't yet provided a sample. Bernard Grusa, the regional vice president for loss prevention, was a notable absentee from the DNA testing. He had been so helpful during the initial stages of the investigation, so they found it odd that he hadn't provided his DNA sample when so many others had willingly done so. Police immediately contacted him on his phone to try and schedule a meeting, but it seemed that setting up a face-to-face -face meeting with Bernard was proving all too difficult. He had apparently had a rough time dealing with Larry's death, so he took an extended leave of absence from work and even moved out of the house he shared with his wife. After approaching his wife for assistance, police quickly learned that Grusa didn't actually leave his house of his own accord, but that his wife had actually taken out a protection order against him and asked him to leave. They learned that only a few weeks before Larry was murdered, Grusa and his wife had an argument. The argument became so heated that Grusa pushed his wife out of the way before running upstairs to the master bedroom and closing the door behind him. A few moments later, his wife heard a gunshot. So when she raced upstairs to check up on her husband, she found Bernard laying face down on the floor. When his panicked wife rolled him over to check if he was okay, Grusa opened his eyes and said that he just wanted to check if she still loved him. It turns out that he fired the gun out of the window to make his wife believe that he shot himself. Police learned that Grusa was actually staying with his father, so they made their way to his dad's house unannounced, and here they found Bernard Grusa. He was a little bit shocked to see the police, but he cooperated with them and willingly provided his DNA sample. Two months later, the results came back, and shockingly, his DNA was an exact match to the DNA found on the baseball cap and DVR machine in Larry's office. Bernard maintained his innocence, claiming that his DNA being on the DVR machine wasn't unusual, as he frequently visited Larry's office due to his role as the VP for loss prevention. He asserted that he had never seen the baseball cap before and had no idea how his DNA ended up on it. Bernard Grusa was arrested for the murder of Larry Wells, and during the police investigation, they uncovered a chilling motive for the murder. Despite being the regional vice president and receiving a salary of around $90,000, it seems that Bernard was drowning in debt. He had huge amounts of medical bills due to his wife being diagnosed with cancer, as well as the fact that he lived way beyond his means. He had accumulated debt of over $1 million and subsequently declared bankruptcy. Police also learned that Grusa had been stealing merchandise from various Toys R Us stores, only to sell the goods on eBay for a fraction of the costs. It was evident that he had been running this scheme for a couple of years, even continuing the scheme after Larry's murder. They estimated that Grusa had stolen over $200,000 worth of merchandise from the stores he was responsible for and then sold the items online. In July 2014, Bernard Grusa made a deal with the state where he agreed to plead guilty to first-degree manslaughter in exchange for him admitting to all of his crimes, as well as forfeiting any appeals. Bernard Grusa admitted to the court that on the morning of June 29, 2013, he entered the Toys R Us store using his key. He said that he entered Larry's office with the intention of stealing money from the safe. He said that Larry walked in on him in the process of trying to open the safe, and that's when he panicked and stabbed Larry. He maintained that he never intended on killing anyone when he entered the store, but only acted out after Larry walked in on him. He also admitted to stealing over $200,000 worth of merchandise from the franchise, as well as over $19,000 in cash from the other branches he was responsible for. Bernard Grusa was sentenced to the maximum penalty of 25 years in prison. My personal opinion is, if you plunge a knife into somebody's chest, or you plunge a knife into somebody's belly, uh, that that manifests an intent to kill somebody, okay? Uh, the appellate courts of this state have held that doing that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, even eight times, is not enough to evince an intent to kill. Sadita says one of the strongest motivating factors in the decision to offer Grusha a plea deal was that Wells' family accepted it. What do you think of this case? Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel, Mysterious Oracle. There are many shocking stories ahead. See you again. Goodbye.